So here we're thinking about different types of security. Um, so we'll look at citizen and community security first, um, and then later this afternoon, maritime and cyber. So what is citizen security? Um, this was mentioned a bit in the morning, so I'll go over it quickly, but starting in independence in the 1960s, in African countries, much of the concern was with territorial security, securing borders, uh, protecting the territorial integrity of the states, these newly independent states. And as we moved through the next few decades, regime security also became um, a, a big security concept that folks were concerned with in terms of um, uh, protecting uh, leadership. Um, I think there's a very elite-focused element of regime security that was involved in that, too. And over the course of particularly after Africa's wave of democratization that started in the 90s, you'll hear more about that tomorrow, these concepts of citizen, community, and human security have become more and more relevant to the way that African actors are thinking about what security is, what are the fundamentals. So the UNDP defines citizen security, which we're talking about now, as promoting peace and security in ways that protect civil, political, and human rights. So the focus is on these rights um, that people are endowed with, and this includes taking measures that might improve people's quality of life in relation to exercising those rights. So this could include things like community crime prevention, improving access to justice, or building this rule of law culture that we, we touched upon in the morning. And citizen security is part of a bigger concept of human security. And human security is looking at the provision of basic social services for people's uh, personal development. And so are we providing for peace at people's basic human needs? Are we providing social services that can prevent things like public health disasters? Um, are we doing things that can help us deal with these megatrends we spoke about this morning proactively? And what kinds of roles does social service provision play in reducing grievances that could spark conflict? So that's the human security concept, which is a much bigger one and, and one that's really a prime focus today. So how can we take citizen and community-based approaches to dealing with security challenges? Here is where, hopefully, some examples start to come into play. So my answer to this is that this would require leaders and policymakers to try to put themselves in the shoes of regular residents and citizens in the different countries that you're working on in your portfolios. So to address citizen and community security concerns, we need to think about questions like, what would you be doing to achieve security if, for example, you live in Mopti? Map there. And in Mopti, there's been a proliferation of armed groups that are all vying for territorial control where you live. And the people who are actually effectively in charge in your area change frequently. What do you do as a resident of that community? Um, another example, what would you do to achieve security if you were a person who was internally displaced through the civil war in Central African Republic, which has been going on since 2013? And you were part of this Muslim community uh, in Bangui, that's displaced. And in Bangui, the capital, you know that if you leave a certain neighborhood, you're very likely to be targeted for violence, either by armed actors or other civilians. So that's another community and citizen security oriented question. And a final example, just to give you a little bit of flavor of the different challenges on the continent, what would you do to achieve security if you were a young person in one of South Africa's majority black townships outside of a major city like Cape Town or Johannesburg, where the state doesn't usually send many police officers in to patrol. And yet, there are very high rates of murder and criminality in your neighborhood. So if you were in one of these situations, what would, be, what would your everyday interactions be like with others? What do you think your everyday concerns would be? What problems would you be trying to solve to survive? Who would you be dealing with to resolve those issues? And what consequences overall might this have for you economically, politically, or even health-wise? These are some of the key citizen and community security questions of inquiry that I think help us take that perspective. What kinds of citizen and community challenges exist in Africa? Um, there are a couple of different angles that I think we could consider when we're trying to get at the resident's perspective on what some of these challenges are. And I'll, again, provide some specific country examples to, to give you some meat on the bones of what we're talking about. So one question you might ask from that resident perspective is, where I live, are state security forces present? And do I have to contend with alternative security providers who are trying to um, do things in my neighborhood? So if you think about northeastern Nigeria, where the terrorist group Boko Haram is active, 
Uh, there have been struggles over the last few years in mobilizing government security forces to effectively go to places that are affected by Boko Haram and protect civilians and their safety. Um, the military doesn't always mobilize in time to address threats when they get early warning uh, information about what's about to go on. If you were following the news when the Chibok girls, the 276 Nigerian schoolgirls who were kidnapped in 2014, this was a huge issue. The military had allegedly received some tips about the fact that this was going to happen and there was an armed group sort of approaching the school, and yet um, there was a failure to mobilize the state security forces in time to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Um, in Nigeria, I think another thing to note with this example in terms of uh, state security forces and other security forces that might be present that you would be dealing with, there are two other um, important entities in the Nigerian context to be thinking about. There's the Multinational Joint Task Force, which is actually an organization that was established back in the mid-90s to combat cross-border crime in Nigeria. But it's been reconstituted in the fight against Boko Haram um, in order to deal specifically with these terrorist attacks and threats in the Northeast. And so people who are living in that area of Nigeria may also come across the MNJTF, the Multinational Joint Task Force, which includes troops from a couple of different contributing countries in the neighborhood. So Cameroon, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, and Benin are now contributors. There are also non-state groups that have mobilized when they've noticed these security threats and when the state security forces uh, have struggled to provide for people's safety. So there's also a civilian joint task force that has been, was somewhat organically formed in the, with the rise of the Boko Haram threat to protect communities. Um, so this includes local vigilante groups, local hunters associations that are armed for other purposes, that in 2013 in Maiduguri in northeastern Nigeria, as Boko Haram began targeting moderate Islamic clerics, for example, some young men who were part of these groups mobilized in an attempt to protect their own communities. And so now they're, they sometimes meet out rather harsh forms of justice. So there are pros and cons to working with these kinds of locally mobilized groups. But there has been a uh, long been discussion about how the state can collaborate with these kinds of civilian forces to deal with this security challenge. OK, so that's one question or one aspect you might consider. Another question you might ask from the resident's perspective in terms of citizen security is, are the security forces responsive and professional? And I will come back to the example of South Africa to illustrate this. In South Africa, you've seen surges in violent crime, especially in urban and peri-urban areas over the last few years or maybe even the last decade. And mob justice, meaning vigilante justice, has become more common, especially as the number of police per capita that are being deployed has reduced. Um, and the government's willingness to deploy to certain townships is also pretty low. Um, so we've seen these surges. Um, and we also see with that um, very low um, popular expectations about what, what the police are going to do for citizens, in the sense that there are quite a few people who, um, when they're surveyed in South Africa, think that the police are rather corrupt. So there are these perceptions of police corruption that also uh, play into why some of these local vigilante groups are mobilizing to do, to do some of the security work on their own. Um, and this does go back, to some extent, to trust in the professionalism of the police. Uh, initially, when these vigilante groups uh, took hold in the urban townships, they initially went after organized crime. So they went after gangs that were engaging in organized crime in these neighborhoods. But since they've eradicated some of the gang activity, these vigilante groups have taken on some of the activities that the gangs themselves were engaging in before. So we now have issues with um, extortion and robbery being committed sometimes by some of these vigilante forces. And that's something that gangs used to do. Um, another example is from Mozambique in the Cabo Delgado area where we're seeing um, several different violent extremist attacks on civilians over the last year or so. The state has led a counterinsurgency campaign um, to try to deal with this threat. But again, in terms of professionalism, there have been um, allegedly some issues with arbitrary detention. So the state officials uh, suspecting certain people of extremism and then detaining them longer than the law might allow them um, in order to investigate somebody. Torture, there have been allegations of that, extrajudicial killings, and media suppression, which is um, a somewhat different kind of 
issue. Um, but all of these things have gone together in terms of the responsiveness and professionalism of the security forces and related services. A third question you might ask is, can I get the civil and administrative services that I need to ensure my human security? Going back to basic services, um, quality of life, sort of definition of security, um, even in some of the places that were mentioned this morning that are pretty well-established democracies like Ghana or Senegal, um, there are still, um, I, I guess, questions about the swiftness with which the courts are working um, on certain issues in, in these countries. And so, for example, um, people rely quite a bit on civil courts or administrative courts to get birth certificates, to get identity documents, marriage licenses. And all of these things may seem like they don't have much to do with security, but in fact, in order to vote, uh, in order to own land, in order to get an education in some countries, having these civil identity documents is vitally important. And so I would argue that civil and administrative forms of justice and not just criminal justice issues play into the human security dynamics that citizens are thinking about in their everyday lives. And often, if citizens are going to be interacting with any of the state justice officials in their country, they're interacting with a civil or administrative court person. Um, so probably some sort of uh, you know, clerk or bailiff who works for a judge in these courts. And so that's very important for shaping citizens' perceptions of whether the state is working for them and in their favor or not. Um, a final question I would ask is, can I get justice for crimes I experienced or disputes that I need resolved? In other words, are there effective, peaceful modes of conflict resolution that are readily available to me where I live? State courts are a part of this, what we might first think of when we're thinking about the answer to this question. But they're only one part of a bigger picture of how justice might work. Historically, in certain countries, people don't always necessarily have the highest degrees of trust in the state courts. In some places they do, in some places they don't. But there are other actors like customary authorities, so um, chiefs, religious leaders um, in certain places, might be considered by the populace to be more relevant entities to go to when you have certain kinds of problems or even when you've experienced certain kinds of crimes. And so one of the readings that was assigned for this session is a summary of research that I've done uh, with the American Bar Association and Harvard Humanitarian Initiative in Central African Republic. We did a household survey there in late 2016, just of residents in the capital city, Bangui. And we asked them a bunch of different questions. Um, we were interested in particular about what life was like in the city after the civil conflict that began in 2013. Um, so the conflict began when a coalition of armed groups from CAR's northeast territories came down and advanced on Bangui. They were displeased. It was a governance-related sort of root cause of the conflict, largely. Um, they, came, they advanced on Bangui. They took over. Um, their provisional leader was eventually convinced to step down, and we had a formal transitional government in 2014. And then after the transitional government, uh, we had peaceful elections for the first time in CAR, in 2016. And since then, we've had a new president. We have a civilian regime that's been elected through multi-party politics. But the state does not exercise a great deal of territorial control outside of the capital of Bangui. So this is a very fragile state setting in which we did this research. But we asked people, what would you do if you were experiencing certain kinds of problems? What if there was a murder? What if you were a victim of sexual and gender-based violence? What if you had a financial dispute? Um, what if you had a family or domestic-related dispute? Um, who would you go to, if anyone? And we also offered them the option of saying, I wouldn't go to anybody. Um, and one of the key takeaways from that research showed that Bangui residents, so some of the most well-off people from a security perspective in CAR at the time, um, often wouldn't go to anybody to deal with some of these problems. They might try to work within their family or friend network to solve security and justice dilemmas. But uh, things were fragile enough in Bangui that people judge that maybe it's better to keep those things within your private informal networks. But when people did reach out to state institutions to solve security and justice problems, residents were more likely to trust and say, I would go to the national police first if I had this kind of problem, or I would go to the courts first if I had this kind of problem in relation to two specific things. And they're both criminal problems. One is murder, and the other is SGBV, sexual and gender-based violence. Um, and so they're much more likely to trust the state institutions to deal as first responders to that kind of security challenge than they would be to going to the state to deal with a land dispute, a financial dispute, a family or community dispute. 
And so all of this is to say, from a citizen perspective on security, there are a multiplicity of groups <coughs> that people have to consider navigating in order to solve their problems related to security and justice just in their everyday lives. And these things are not always actually their number one concerns. When you ask the Bangui residents on the survey, what are the main things that you're worried about? Insecurity was number four. The things that, that came before that were good lighting in my neighborhood, mm. which of course is also related to security in some ways, good water, potable water, and electricity. And so even these insecurity issues, um, if we're working in a very fragile context where some of these other basic humanitarian needs are not provided for, it's, it's all relative, of course. So these people-centered perspectives we need to take into account when we're designing security se sector responses to these different kinds of violence and conflict we see in these countries. And I think supporting security sector officials who tap into this way of thinking about security, people who are creative about integrating citizen perspectives from their everyday lives into their work is really key. And I think that's something we could all um, look out for as US government, um, people working on, on African issues. And I think it's also important to approach these issues knowing that there are community outreach and participatory governance techniques that have been used successfully by African actors to deal with some of these challenges. And this is segueing quite a bit into the, new, the next panel with Ina. So I will just leave it by saying a couple of key techniques that we'll now get to explore. Community policing. This is when police and community members collaborate to provide safety and security in their locations. Another is a very general term, but participatory governance. So whether that's having a national dialogue that involves citizens about security challenges or when you're building a national security strategy, for what we said this morning, whether that's involving citizens or civil society in budgeting for security sector resources, that's another way to do this um, that the Africa Center has experience in. And finally, another technique is community paralegalism. Um, and when I did work at ABA, we do quite a bit of this. Um, getting educated residents from a particular community to raise awareness of their neighbors about the justice options that they have um, to deal with different problems they may have. Um, these paralegals also often are links to connect people to policemen um, or women, um, to lawyers, to psychosocial workers, to various people that you might want to talk to when you're dealing with some of those criminal and civil justice issues that we were just talking about. So each of these approaches helps to link people to state justice and security actors, solve pressing problems, and hopefully help to build you know, local trust between, between these actors. I'll leave it there.